Okay. Thank you, Neville, for being here today for this honor. Um, as I said in the beginning, I don't think Neville really needs much of an introduction, so but I was asked to do one anyway, so I'm going to try to be short of it. Neville is a brand strategist, a <coughs> art director, creative director, and designer, educator, uh, a voice to defend or to challenge design. Um, like a lot of people here, probably, a lot of designers, uh, there's a lot of music informed or inspired, maybe, at the beginning of his career. When I was a young designer, and you were creative director of uh, The Face, your iconic work inspired every single designer around me, and I must confess today that I shamefully copied some of your work uh, inspired by <laughs> Uh, you founded a branding consultancy that's called Research Studio that had actually a, an office in Paris also, and the young man had his here somewhere, he was your associate. Uh, you co-founded FunFun with Eric Speakerman, um, and today you have founded Birdie Associates with as offices in London. No, just one, just one. Just one. Um, that's about it, I guess. Oh, yes, and then I, I just read something strange that you ventured into the metaverse. Ah. So, okay. I hope you can tell us about that. Well, a little bit. We'll anyway, so the iconic Neville Brody. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Petra, thank you. That was great. <laughs> no, no, that was really. I, I, I nearly left. I was like, <laughs> afterwards. Um, so I'm, I've got a rambling set of 300 slides. Um, <laughs> there is more B. There's more B. <laughs> in, in, the middle. in the middle. Exactly. Yes. Um, but you said. Jean-François, you said 30, 40 minutes, right? <laughs> what does this mean? I take, it, I take instruction. You mean depending how fast you will speak or...? But I figured if it's 30 minutes and there's 300 slides, that's 10 a minute. So it's still six seconds a slide, right? There is a French guy called Antoine de Cause who've done Rapido and you have done that super quickly. So maybe we do that on that way or...? Okay, so three minutes. <laughs> okay, so um, take your time. I'm going to take my time. Um, I don't know where to start. Um, this is the first time I've spoken in Paris in maybe twenty years. It's only the third time I've done a lecture in Paris. It just goes. Oh, shut up! <laughs> I'm here because he paid me to come. <laughs> No, the sponsor of it. Ah, <laughs> it wasn't enough. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, it, it, does, it doesn't cover the hotel, the taxi. <laughs> the We're going to talk. <laughs> um, so, um, thank you, Aaron. And that was a, a bit, in, like, not embarrassing, but I never think of my work as having those kind of moments as it were. Um, I'm always interested in how things develop more than what those things might mean. Um, and, you know, if you're a graphic designer, um, your, I think, duty is to be completely obsessed by what you do. I mean, Petra, you're obsessed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you have to give up most of the rest of your life mm -hmm. if you want to do it properly. I want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and you end up working, you know, seven days a week. You end up working nights, and it's just an obsession. And you have to keep challenging. You have to keep developing. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that um, we've been interested in in terms of my studio, the work I've done, the work that I've done with other people in collaboration. And most of the work I do is all about the basis of our philosophy, which is everything is language. Um, the way we walk through a city or the way we 
live through our days or the way we choose to communicate or the way we choose to think about our existence, this is all informed by different forms of language. And the language might be natural. It might be um, the clouds in the sky. This is a form of language in coding. It might be a sign on a street. This is a deliberate form of instruction. Um, and these different codes tell us how to act. They tell us how to behave. They tell us how to respond. Um, and today I'm going to focus really very much on the, the typography and the type design and the use of type in the, in the work I do. Because ultimately, type design is a way of telling people how to respond to content. So every typeface design is a way of influencing the way you understand a message. Um, and type design is something that we often think about the words it's saying, and we rarely think about the form it takes, because the form it takes is the thing that influences the way we think. And so what we've done a lot as a studio is we've challenged the forms. We've pushed things into spaces which are more sculptural, where maybe the letter forms themselves start to, to decay. So we're looking for that edge of textual legibility, and that point at which an emotional or an unpreconditioned response might, might come into effect. So we're looking for this edge, we're looking for that point of abstraction where maybe something new can happen, um, maybe something unpredicted could happen. And we play, we experiment, because I think that these days people have become so risk averse. People don't think about taking risks that might fail. We've become so commoditized in the way we run our businesses and our society that we don't want to take risks anymore because they might not work. We may not earn the money. Um, it might not sell tickets. Um, it might not have enough likes on Instagram. So we don't take risks, but I think that we actually need to start re-embracing um, failed or failing um, uh, convention. And we're always pushing, we're always looking for that point at which something collapses. So here, this is using 3D software to the point where it, it, it couldn't handle the content. It couldn't handle the amount of information we were pushing through it. And this in itself sparked uh, a way of thinking. We embraced this accident to start producing a lot of different works off the basis of this. So we need to find the point at which our systems collapse. And that's the point where something new can happen. Um, most of our lives are spent re repeating patterns. Um, we learn patterns, we repeat them, they become familiar, they become comfortable, and we use those patterns to survive sometimes, or to um, become rich, or to become famous, or to become popular. Um, but the reality is those patterns themselves kind of restrict who, who we can be. They restrict our potential, so we always need to be pushing our communication spaces to the point of breakdown. So at the beginning I'm showing some things where typography actually becomes a transport system for something we might not expect. Historically, typography is used as a transport system to deliver ideas, cultures, um, instructions in a way that we do expect. So essentially, the written word is, is a distribution system. We use it to distribute. When, as soon as we communicate, we're using our language and our communication skills to transport a meaning of some kind. Um, don't worry, the whole lecture is not going to be as, as serious and depressing as this. Um, but most of it. <laughs> So here we're using programming to try and get digital environments to respond in a more physical, liquid way. Um, in a way, data on paper is fixed, unless you cross it out and write a new piece of data in, but in, in digital form, that data is never fixed. It's always fluid, it's always subject to change. And so we embrace these 
possibilities of, again, finding the edge of something where it can break down and produce a different meaning. So a lot of my time is spent, I hate typography. I've always hated typography. Um, I didn't want to get into typography. I was obsessed with image making. So when I left college, I was doing, as Aaron suggested, I was doing a lot of record covers. And at a certain point, bands stopped being interested in um, interesting imagery. And they started to be interested in, in what haircuts they have and how they would look in their portraits on the cover. And so I kind of gave up the record business as a result of that, because those possibilities of, of exploration were disappearing, and ended up somehow focusing on the typography, because this is something that we've seen happen over the last, say, 30 or 40 years, until this point now, where, especially in digital media, um, graphic design has become a bit of a, um, a, say, an obstacle to what digital media is trying to do, which is shift the user very quickly from the entry point to another page, or to buying something, or to liking something. So graphic design in that space gets in the way. And what you end up with is graphic engineering. Uh, this is interesting. This is from 1988. Um, this is for a French uh, fashion company, Paris based. And here we were trying to explore the possibilities of concrete poetry mixed with um, bitmap. At the time, we didn't have laser printers, so everything had to be printed out on dot matrix. And technology is something that's really shifted the way that we work um, and its impact and the way it makes us think is it's impossible to separate from the way we, we create and what we create. And before the Mac existed, we were doing everything by hand, of course. And then the Mac came along and started to allow things like this to happen. Um, and this was a tiny A4 file, and we had to send it live to Tokyo to be printed the next day. And that was for us, the, the biggest revolutionary thing that ever happened. Um, because we'd never done that before. You, you had to buy um, a, a courier to take the, the work to Japan at that point, and it would have taken three days just to get there. Um, but we did this in a few hours, and, and it just shifted everything. And now, we don't think twice about being always on and always present. So this is a piece of work done for another Japanese magazine, and um, in this case, we didn't add anything. We just took their logo, which is plus eight one, and realized by turning it sideways, it, it formed a face. So all we did was, was just interfere very slightly and shift the perception of what they were doing. The GQ 10th anniversary cover, um, based on the 10, which then became a bird, and the editor said, we like the way you haven't included our copy lines. And to be honest, we forgot, <laughs> <laughs> which sometimes happens. Poster for uh, an alternative set of posters for the World Cup in 2014, 2018. And here for a wallpaper magazine. Um, we gave them a font, which then they cut out of paper, um, re-photographed, and then digitally printed the, the photographs of the cutouts of the digital fonts. Um, and on the cover, we printed the word wallpaper in white on the front, because we realized that most of their magazines are sent out in the post, so they didn't even need a title on the cover. So all the time, we're trying to think about how to offset the normalities of of our uh, conventions, of the way we communicate. This is Black Hat, we've done a number of film titles. Um, this lecture's part sales pitch, by the way. <laughs> um, especially here, so this is something Aaron mentioned. Um, we're working with um, an NFT company, Paris-based, um, called Dagami. Um, and they're kind of out of Switzerland, and it's about dogs, which may surprise you. 
Um, but we're trying, what we're trying to do with this is reverse the, the thinking so that instead of starting with a movie and ending up with an NFT, we're trying to start with an NFT and end up with a movie. So we're, we're trying to reverse the whole process. And I think NFTs, are, I mean, we could spend the next evening discussing the validity of NFTs um, and spurious emperor's new clothes, do they exist or not? Will we all lose our houses by gambling on them? We'll see. But fundamentally, um, coming back right to the, the serious stuff, that all design is political. Meaning everything we do influences the way someone thinks. And in doing that, it means that we are politically involved. So we cannot separate ourselves from the responses to the work we are showing. And designers are here <coughs> to take largely invisible concepts and make them tangible. So we might take insurance, or we might take um, hope, or we might take um, conservatism, and we then have to translate that into a tangible form. And when we do that, we actually translate based on our own interpretation. And when we do that, we're then kind of telling people what they should be thinking about, what we're communicating. So we need to be constantly aware of our involvement in that process and its impact on what we, we um, communicate. I mean, when I went to art school, they said that the role of the designer is to be invisible. Um, and we quite quickly, and that's the way it's been for a number of decades, and then we quite quickly re realized that that's an impossibility, that you cannot separate yourselves from the receipt of the message. So when we tell a story, the way we tell that story becomes part of that story. It's inseparable. Otherwise, we'll just give the components to the, the receiver or the viewer, and then they can restructure it themselves. But we're not doing that. We're doing that for them. We're kind of pre, pre patrolling them. Um, so Free Me From Freedom, this came about from living in the UK under um, increasingly totalitarian governments who increasingly take away uh, the freedom to protest or the freedom to um, party even. And this is something we signed up to. By signing up to the idea of freedom, um, we, we, we gave away our our options. Um, and this turned into a booth in the Design Museum. Um, we use a lot of reverse lines, so protect me from my protectors, um, data valence. And the booth ended up like this. And in London at this time, this is what, 12 years ago? When you went from the outskirts of London to the centre of London, you were probably photographed at least 400 times. Um, and you were on security cameras. And we set up this booth with um, a facsimile of 400 cameras inside. And some of them, a large number, actually had real cameras in. And we had a number of computers at the back that then amalgamated all of these and c produced a composite file that was published on Flickr um, every 30 seconds. And if you knew the time you'd gone in, you could go home and check the time and see an image of yourself in 400 uh, small variations to give yourself a sense. And it's even more now, it's far more increased. This is a poster for uh, Parkinson's. And Parkinson's is, is the result of which is, is a kind of loss of identity. So nearly all the words here, we, we took out the letter I. So I is missing from this. Um, and then at the other end of the extreme, this was representing the campaign to make poverty history and can we act as one? Can we act as a global planet about <coughs> these incredibly um, challenging difficulties for people with less money? And um, um, inequality is increasing and we're, we're living in a space where um, rich people are getting in, rich aren't going to shut up. I think that's enough politics. So on the fun side of things, um, 
This is for the African National Congress, who were fighting South African apartheid at the time. This was an alternative to the London Olympics poster. There was a set of posters that were commissioned by Graham Wood. And uh, this is based on the idea of spin. So it's, it's the constant propagandization of the Olympics. And then sometimes we try and use, um, work with some of our clients and brands as ways of, of, of incorporating, incorporating that messaging. So this is with Supreme. And they came back and they wanted something which looked a bit 80s. I mean, I think I have 80s before <laughs> uh, for some obscure reason. But anyway, uh, but he gave us the opportunity to do kind of riot coats, uh, the riot that never was, um, Supreme, how to get arrested. So they were, they were willing to work with us to put these kind of um, provocative slogans onto pieces of clothing. At the other end of the extreme is where we need to eat. Um, <laughs> And it's always a challenge. You know, I'm not an artist. I'm not doing paintings and then trying to sell those paintings, even though that's still a market-based um, uh, industry. Um, so there's always a compromise. Um, we work with a lot of clients that politically I would question myself. Financially, I'm really pleased. <laughs> and Christian Dior is one of them. I mean, we did this with Lionel in, with the French studio here. Um, but the challenge with with Christian Dior, the CD logo, they didn't have a real emblem before. And they needed something that could end up at either way up, so that when it was on the top of a bottle of something, it didn't matter which way up it was, it was still really the CD. And they wanted it made in one single piece, so that they could use it in physical items and accessories, like a belt buckle or a clasp. And so, what looks very simple actually was a, was a, a, a several month reductive process to end up at uh, something that was scalable and portable. The RCA was, uh, I mean I'm still teaching that somehow, um, despite falling out with many of them. Uh, but we did the branding for them when I joined, this is about 2010. Um, the first thing we did, because everything was centered, so we moved everything to a ranged position. And I know that's not exciting in itself, but actually it allowed us to then position the branding at any place and make it more dynamic. Um, here's what the logo was previously. And then as we started to work with different campaigns, um, we started to get into the idea of a component approach to everything. So for the 175th anniversary, it just became these blocks. But then what became interesting for me was this typeface. This typeface was designed by Margaret Calvert um, and had been used for the, and she was one of the main professors there uh, before me. Um, she designed most of Britain's uh, uh, road signs um, and typefaces for railway stations and hospitals and airports. And she did this typeface called Calvert. Um, and we wanted to create a new font that was again a component. So we took the typeface. Um, and it's, it's not really um, based on thicks and thins. Um, so what we did was we, we forced the outline inwards to a point where it started to break down. Um, we made it slightly wider. And then we went in and took the result and started redrawing and cleaning up by hand uh, to end up with something that looked a bit more like this. So it's got its roots in the original typeface and now we've got something that's actually based on the sum of its parts. So now it's a component system that works with other component ideas we were having. The idea was that it, it becomes incredibly scalable. The, a, a small size, it's legible, it's crisp, so you can print it on, on bad quality paper. And at the large size, it just becomes a, a set of shapes. So this for the original sketches. Um, on the left, it was cut into metal. 
in the middle, this was how it might be sprayed on to a wall, and on the right is, is printed in vinyl. Some early experiments that a fine high rest. Okay, so I've left some notes on there. <laughs> there may be more. <laughs> It doesn't look that low res. <laughs> I mean, I think at the back it probably looks high res. And then uniting all of the signage in throughout the, the university using the font. Uh, using it for impact. This is for the things you put on glass to stop people walking into the glass. Um, and then, I hate Rooney, <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is we, we, we were asked by Nike to um, design the numbers for the last World Cup um, and, um, and we, we did a lot of radical ideas and in the end FIFA, uh, which is the International Football Association, or Federation of International Football Associations, they said they wanted something legible, um, which was kind of weird for us. Um, but what I realized is that, that everything now, because of technology, becomes so scaled that the, the way we approach communication has changed. And um, when we do a book cover or a record cover or something that's in print that's going to appear in Amazon, for instance, we don't think about the experience of what happens when you buy the book. We think more about what happens when you're going to buy a book, which is, does it work as a thumbnail? And it's the same for watching sports. So these numbers, I mean, the, the referee knows what every player is, what they're called. And the commentators know <coughs> who each player is. Um, and most people are going to watch these matches on small screens. So they're going to watch it on mobile. So the numbers then, um, the legibility of the numbers takes over from any kind of creative concerns and FIFA were more concerned about how it looked on a mobile screen than they were about how it was as a piece of culture. And we designed the, the naming typeface and we designed the numbers. As I said, I wish I'd bought it with me. Um, it's a lot more extreme than this, the originals. Um, my mum my mom was quite pleased about this. <laughs> She likes it when, when I do things she's heard of. Um, so yeah, and we, we've just been working with um, FIFA again to develop the England Women's World Cup team for the, the next World Cup. And then Coca-Cola. Um, this was for a celebration of their 100th anniversary of the bottle design, the iconic bottle. And they asked a few different designers to think about posters. And I couldn't think of anything more represent representative of the bottle than the bottle. Um, so repeated it, all done by hand, turned, and then reversed out of the layer underneath. So there's a sort of randomness. It's not mathematically worked out. Um, and it ends up like this as a crop. Um, and this is how it is in the, the headquarters of um, the world's biggest manufacturer of sugared drinks. <laughs> um, so it's a conflict. I'm so proud of this, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> but not so ashamed that we didn't then continue working with them. <laughs> um, so this is the first time they've ever commissioned their own proprietary typeface. And for this, we had the, the joy, actually, it was, of spending three days in their archives in, in Atlanta. Um, looking at, I mean, it's like the scene at the end of Citizen Kane where there's this huge warehouse of hundreds of crates of old stuff and we could just explore anything. Um, and we ended up with a typeface that needed to work at scale, digitally, and large in print. Um, that it could work in motion graphics, that it could also um, capture some of Coca-Cola's personality, whatever that was. So we spent, as I said, a lot of time taking images out of their, their archives and seeing 
if there was something continuous through all of their typographic languages. We ended up in this kind of American Gothic space where it feels geometric, but there's always another little quirk or something disproportionate that's going on, like the, this A of the master, the lower, the lower part of that screen. And pulling these out and gradually synthesizing everything all the way down, <coughs> looking at these, I mean, incredible. I love these, I'm you know, perhaps thinking about some of the stuff that you were showing. But that, that vernacular, you know, the sign writing stuff is just incredible. And there's so many ideas in it. And we, we lose that edge. You know, when we're converting these into kind of generic typefaces. So how can we bring some of that back in? So we tested Coca-Cola's like, level of um, comfort. How much quirk could we bring in to, to actually, at the end of the day, the world's biggest drinks company? Um, and we largely based a lot of the elements also on the Coca-Cola thing, so that the circle got replicated. Um, and we ended up here, so it's a sort of invisible, visible typeface. So here's what I was talking about, where typography manipulates, but invisibly. So we've done something that spent we spent like months developing in order for it to seem invisible. And now you don't see it anymore. <laughs> Um, and similarly, at around the same time, we also developed uh, the, all the on-screen typefaces for Samsung. Um, uh, we called it Samsung One because at the time of working with them, they had a number of different divisions. Each division had its own typeface, had its own icon system. We started off developing their new icon system. Um, and we realized again that the only way that that could work for them is if they had one typeface mechanism that was able to work across every platform, every object, every interface, um, every territory. So it could work um, printed large in a store again, it could work small on a mobile phone. Um, it had to be economic, so you need to fit a lot of lettering into one space. Um, it needed to be flexible in terms of weight. It needed to be flexible across a myriad of <coughs> languages. We ended up developing 26, 26 different scripts, which I'll get to in a minute. And we had to build in um, essentially a DNA. So there was a DNA of characteristics, which then were carried by every single character, every single weight, every single style of the typeface. And it needed to be easily legible. So we did a lot of legibility testing at different scales, using different forms. Large X height, uh, very squared, so that you get a lot of air inside the letters, not outside. We're used to often reading lettering from, from the outside of the letter form, but in a digital context, we often need to read the space inside the letter form. So we opened up everything, pushed things out to corners. The X height was pushed as high as we could get it um, within the, the line space available. Um, we, as I said, created 26 writing systems. This took another three years. Uh, 400 different languages, um, huge amount of glyphs, and we worked with a lot of local partners. And we created this kind of global DNA for this, where, where different scripts would share the same approaches to similar challenges, like junctions. Um, this is a, a sample of some of the different scripts. So straight to curve junctions, this was shared throughout everything we did. We find the, uh, the use of the spur, which is there for legibility, and comes out of calligraphic, uh, calligraphic, um, basis, um, this is where the pen then joined and left the mark, and it aids legibility, especially at, at very small sizes. Making sure that the angle of the cut is a, is a tangent to the curve, rather than going against the curve. Getting a rhythm. Are you doing a selfie? <laughs> 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 <Just checking. laughs> 
Come up and come up with yourself. Um, so what are you doing? Say I know. Say it's necessary. Can you ask yourself. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, I, I pay each one for us to do this. <laughs> so, thinking about common common approaches to rhythm, um, angular forms sometimes highly geometric. And then here's a small sample, again invisible, um, and the type had to work as a piece of machinery. It had to enable communication on very different challenging technological environments and platforms. Um, sometimes it just has to work and sometimes it shouldn't be calling out. Um, but again, we're still putting messages and values into this design that says something about Samsung, about you know, reliability, um, trustworthiness, um, the peak of technolo technological um, uh, seamlessness. So there's a lot of messages that goes that goes into this, and it's very low on <coughs> personality and very high on function. But the function itself becomes part of the personality. Oh, um, my the guy who runs the business told me to put this slide in. <laughs> um, so if anyone thinks that they would like to work with us <laughs> or collaborate with us in type design and typography. Please photograph this now. <laughs> and if I don't do this, he's, he said he was going to fire me. <laughs> um, L'Occitane, um, again, um, very technical. We've just finished working with them on developing a sans and a serif that would work together. Um, and brands these days don't create much. Um, say creative communication and this is largely to do with technology and brands these days don't manufacture much but they do manufacture stories and they seek content and as we know on Instagram uh, yesterday's Instagram post is quickly forgotten um, um, so then the way that you tell a story becomes the most important thing and one of the most important things about the way you tell a story is the transport systems that you design to tell that story. So in this case, in most cases, it's about the typeface that you use. So we developed the serif and the sans for L'Occitane, again trying to capture the values of L'Occitane um, and the personality in, in the, the typeface design, so that at the end of the day they could do any piece of communication and it would still feel like L'Occitane. Um, we built in certain characteristics that were based on a, 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 a lot of workshopping that we did together. The sands had to match a lot of the characteristics of the serifs so that they could combine. Um, we did a lot of work on bringing personality into the, the ligatures. We thought this was an area of creativity that, that would be unique and that they could own. So we did a huge amount of ligatures for this. How am I doing for time? Is everyone at home? <laughs> Ask Sam. Okay. Um, Longine, very quickly, because this isn't very interesting, even though um, we're quite proud of this. Um, again, we spent a lot of time in their archives looking at characteristics and putting those characteristics into tiny detailing so that at display. Um, the font would be maybe what they would need to, to use. And it would still work at small scale in terms of uh, something that was highly legible and crisp and clear. So some of our explorations came here. The G came from a very early, I think 1920s, 1930s version of their logo type. Um, and we pulled all of this together, uh, making changes between the display and the text because obviously the text, you don't need as much decoration.
40 years after punk started. How am I doing for time, John? It's 21.16. Is anyone in a rush? Okay. Yeah, Latin country, we go out late. Okay, okay. We go out late. In UK, they sleep already, but they're awake. <laughs> Very funny, Jean Prosperity. <laughs> um, so, 40 years after punk started, there was a celebration of punk in London. And a lot of different events happened, and we were asked to find a way to bring all of these events together as, as one statement. So, we thought the best way was to create a typeface and give that typeface to everyone for free. So, that anyone that could. could uh, think of something that, that would be part of the celebrations, could use the font and then um, be recognizably part of a, a single festival. So it became a very kind of um, intuitive collective in a way. Um, and based on a stencil approach, we thought then slicing the, the main words then gave us more stencil capability. So everything could be perfected <coughs> at the end of the day. And then everything could be united under one. I mean, these great pictures by Derek Ridges from the time, um, but brought to life digitally. So we're trying to think about ways that we could think about um, photocopying early enlargements from half turn screens. Um, and they ended up um, in the, the underground system in London. Um, on the streets. And Channel 4 asked us, because there are, are, everyone knows Channel 4? Nobody knows Channel 4. So Channel 4 is, is an independent, but government owned, but independently managed British channel, um, TV channel. And they're always famous for doing kind of challenging programming, always standing up for the outsider, not the norm. Uh, they're incredibly popular and, and they always uh, take very different angles on their, their content. And they wanted us to help them move to a place where they didn't need to use uh, their brand, their logo anymore. And they felt that the best way to do that was to work with us on developing a typeface. Uh, a typeface that would then contain a lot of their personality characteristics. So we based the, the, the beginning on, um, this is kind of British 20th century typography. Grotesques, Gil Sands, um, the Johnson font for the London Underground system, um, naive grotesques. And we developed two typefaces, one which was Chadwick, which was the clean modern British Gothic. And the other one was Horse Ferry, and we saw that as um, you know, the, the family member at the table who always throws his food against the wall or um, pushes the table over. So the horse ferry became the one that carried the personality through everything. And now in the UK, if you see the horse ferry font, you know immediately that it's Channel 4. They don't need to use their logo now in a lot of places. Um, and here's how the two overlaid. Um, differences, but basically the same story. So the clean one is used for information, like the news and weather. Um, I, I meant to bring a, an animation, apologies. Um, but on screen, um, this is all they use. So um, as soon as you see this, you know that Channel 4 is speaking. Um, I wanted to share a quick with a fuse. Um, I don't know, does anyone know, here know fuse? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think I make four. <laughs> so fuse was, fuse is 1990. Uh, fuse is 32 years old. Uh, yeah, fuse, I have this one. You have this one? Yes, I have. Can I buy it? <laughs> I can um, rent it. I can rent it. <laughs> So Fuse took the advantages of uh, digital technology that said that anyone can design a typeface. And that had never, ever happened before. So this was the first time ever you could sit down and design your own font. So designers finally had 
the um, uh, opportunity to design their own typefaces. We wanted to take that one step further. We said, well, what, what if we use this as an idea to challenge what conventional typography is? <coughs> um, what happens if we bring uh, designers in that are not traditional type designers, and maybe some that are, and challenge them to think differently about what a font is? And we started off with the basic idea that language is a contract between two different parties. And the contract says, you and I are sharing a number of elements that we've agreed that when you structure in a certain way, they create a certain meaning. An alphabet is simply a set of components that we share, that when we put those components together, we form increasingly complex meaning between us. So again, it's a transport system. And then the question comes, well, why 26 characters? Why not, why not 26,000 or why not two? Um, and we allowed designers then to think about what a font could be. And we allowed them to use the keyboard as a way of exploring new, new thoughts about communication. So this is by Tibor Kalman. Um, sadly passed a few years ago from Emenko and he decided that all capital letters were good words and all lowercase letters were bad words so as you typed you had this fight between good and evil for this typeface I took the negative space between characters and that formed this kind of illegible space based on something we're very familiar with Tobias Freer Jones recorded conversations on the streets of New York and put complete phrases in different key positions. So if you type a T, you might get on schedule come up. <laughs> so you would build a conversation just by typing different words. Uh, David Crow took this even further and he, by using negative spacing and abstract marks, every time you typed your name, a new face would appear that would be different to someone else's typed name. So he was thinking about typography and language as, as identity. It's Paul Ellerman got his students to create different letter forms in a passport booth. Um, this was based on William Burroughs' idea <coughs> of a cut-up. So by taking sections of a newspaper and putting a different section in each character, and typing, you would, you would create a completely new story, which is um, somehow the basis of his cut-up technique. Cornell Wimblin, mm -hmm. on the left, this is reminding us that um, typography in language is quite mechanical. On the right, this is taking marks from, I think, the Bader meinhof gang. Um, so moving something which was threatening and dangerous into something that looked kind of soft and cuddly. And the great Gerard Unger, Harald Unger, who decided that he only wanted 10 characters in his typeface, so that you could either use them to compile the real letter forms or something completely new and abstract. Um, for Fuse 10, we realized that abstract form had existed in music in painting and sculpture and um, even in writing but it had never existed in typeface design before um, so we said we don't need to, to say words anymore let's focus on the rhythm and the look that a, a typeface can bring um, we thought about this as a keyboard creating visual music um, we did a lot of different experiments and I think this is a really interesting <coughs> space um, and it allows us to rethink really about the way the computer works for us and can we use it to create more play or different experiences. Again from Tobias, that the more you typed the more noise it created so the more illegible it became. This was Annalisa Schoenke who found plastic spoons on the floor of the canteen at the Royal College of Art and broke them into letter forms. I love this. This is um, 
okay notes on it by Mr. J. Smith. Um, as you type words, you get different identities. So we're all criminals with this one. And finally, explicit FFM, who went beyond the form completely and, and created letter forms based on textures and grids. This is called land writing, where it's a facsimile of it, real writing, but was developed by program. And this was Jason Bailey, um, who was working with us at the studio in London for a long while. Um, and this, his mother um, suffered from multiple cirrhosis. And she wanted to use her writing, this is her best attempt at writing, she wanted to use that as a way of expressing how it was suffering from multiple cirrhosis. So Jason used that as the, the basis for this incredibly, I think, incredibly emotive typeface. And the picture is of his mother when she was 16, just before she started suffering from MS. You know, so typography and language can carry other forms of narrative. Um, this is part of the, the final fuse, which was fuse 20. And we're going beyond form completely now, and we're kind of starting to evolve back into the real world. And this was actually commissioned then Converse, and we ended up in the middle of Beijing on the side of an industrial building in the middle of an artistic district, and not knowing that this, this factory was right next to it. <laughs> a piece of so I'm going to just show you very quickly the Enter Design Festival, because as it says here, success doesn't always mean numbers. And I think we need to move back into that space of complexity, not entropy, of making things difficult, not simple, of moving beyond the idea that it's either you or me, or make America great again, or um, Brexit, or simple slogans that the world is being reduced to. And this is entropic. It means it's becoming granular. We need to rebuild complexity all over again. The Anti-Design Festival was all about tearing down the walls, experimenting. It ended up here in East London. Um, we had 10 spaces over 10 days. We had 20,000 people turn up. Uh, we tried to copyright the word no. <laughs> this is the program. So everything was chaotic, everything was possible, nothing was permanent, everything fell apart afterwards. You couldn't buy anything. Um, people visiting could bring their own stuff and put it in the exhibition. Uh, this is the waiting room. This is what a bunch of cunts, but I'm not allowed to say that because we're in my broadcast, so drop us off. We used old technology, and why not? Uh, we had talks, we had an open exhibition space, anyone could send anything into that, and we would make sure it was on the wall. We ran workshops. This is called exquisite corpses. People bought different parts of an object that we then put together and then reveal the whole thing by taking it apart. Um, I, love, I love this on the left. Are you troubled or depressed, worried, lonely, despairing? Um, instant note inside. And the drawers were empty, of course. Um, making drawings straight onto film and then projecting at the end of the day. Um, Yuri Suzuki, who's now with Pentagram, used a thumb scanner to scan random barcodes and create sound and music. Uh, some of the different very comfortable home furnishings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we asked Ayn, the British graffiti artist, <coughs> to put a uh, piece of graffiti all down the side of the building, the main building, and he put anti, anti, anti. And then Mother, the advertising agency on the other side of the building, they, they commissioned him afterwards, and he put pro, pro, pro. Um, and I'm gonna let you think about that. Not now, but later. We had performances, we had visual Tourette's, uh, we had a pixel wall made of plastic cups, 
that people could then rearrange. Uh, we had um, Dominic Wilcox, who every day created a new experiment um, a design idea. He, he did a, a pop-up city that he put on the fold-down tray in a train and then left the train. So whoever sat down next would fold down the, the table and get this pop-up city that they didn't expect. And this is day 15. This is his smoothie maker. And you put a lot of fruit in a football. You zip it up, play the football match. And then at the end, you pour out the smoothie. Um, I'm going to leave it there, Jean Francois. I think. So thank you for listening. You've been very patient. especially in, in a place like an art school or a design school you've got an opportunity that you may never get again and you, you just have to kind of tear everything up and rethink it and see it from a different position um, I think language is, is critically important it's the way we learn to see the world Designed the packaging of macromedia as a software. Well, I, I, my, I won my job. <laughs> and uh, with, uh, I was, I was, uh, this was uh, the first artwork I see from you when I, I'm old enough to have bought this kind of software. And uh, um, in retrospective, how do you see this kind of work? These tools do not exist anymore. And, with, with uh, the typeface, I, I think I think it, I think it, it was a, a farm bureau home. I think it was a typeface you used. So, how do you see in, 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 in with respect to this kind of artwork? Uh, mm -hmm. you know? um, yeah, God, that was when was that? Late nineties. Yeah. yeah. Um, does it, Does anyone remember or know Macromedia? Free yeah. Yeah. Um, can I show of hands, who here hates Adobe? Because <laughs> <laughs> Adobe, Adobe bought Macromedia and then they killed the only software I was using, which was free. <laughs> Bastards. Um, but I can't say, is this, is, is Adobe watching this? <laughs> <laughs> it's monotype, they don't care. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and, and it's funny to see that artwork now. It was so complicated. Um, but they wanted they wanted artwork that could kind of show off <coughs> the software in a way. So that was so difficult to do. And the typeface was called Venus. It was a, a reworking of uh, a, an old grotesque Gothic font, which is beautiful. Wow, you remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't look that old, right? <laughs> <laughs> he started young. <laughs> huh? He started very young. Started very, we all started very young. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Okay. Good 
Could you work for a new magazine in the future? Could I work for a new magazine in the future? Yes. Yeah. Are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I love magazines. I was going to show, I was going to show some magazine work, but was, I, I, I was being too political for too long, um, so we ran out of time. But yeah, I love magazines. Um, I mean, for me, there's two important things about type: is is do you create a new font, or and is that where the story is, or is it the way you use a typeface? And in magazines, it's very much about how you use a typeface. I mean, and I think that's an incredibly creative space. And now we're using less and less print. And I think web design is so fucking boring. Right? I call it um, utility bills with pictures. Because it all looks like an invoice. Um, and everything is homogenous. It all looks the same. Um, I actually have another theory, which is graphic design is dead. Um, and that it had 100 years from Dada to TikTok. So Dada happened in, in 1916, TikTok started in 2016. And now I, I think it's largely, it's a lot of graphic engineering and graphic decoration. But it, it, I don't think it's graphic design anymore. Um, so it's, it's really shifted. Um, and graphic design as a craft is loved by graphic designers, but most people in the public, especially younger people, they don't, they don't know what value that has, because it's all about the amount of likes you get, or um, how many followers, or, and it's, it's, a, it's a reductive thing. And I, I, I know some people that work at Google, and the goal is, as I said before, is to move people very quickly that land on the page. Um, they either want to keep them on the page or move them from the page. Um, because they earn money either way. Um, they said graphic design gets in the way. So yeah, I think magazines might be a new really interesting space. Like record covers. You know, we're back to a lot of vinyl. Yeah. Sorry, I know that wasn't your question. <laughs> When I was younger, I was at the Centre Pompidou or uh, Monography. Um, but quickly I switched to more classical typography. But now I'm doing designing more classical typography. So I have to wait more maybe to buy the new edition of the monography. But besides this uh, stupid joke, I'm asking all uh, you deal with typeface design. Um, there is, I will say, design agency who hire typeface, typeface designer who do the typeface stuff to, to bring with, your, with the branding they do. Um, there is people like you who have designed typeface before the computer or in the early days of the computer. There is people like I speak who have done a lot of branding or hire typeface designer to do or to be a uh, creative director of the typeface or helping at certain level, how oh, it works. This day for you, the letter forms. Are you drawing some of them or direct them, how oh, it works? Um, well, it's a mixture. I mean, I, might, so I make sketches. Um, and we work, I, you know, I think type designers have become very kind of different to the way it used to be. It used to be like, Honestly, at one point it was it was only men. Yes. Um, it was only men, and you had to spend years and years and years training. Um, and even be before then, you would be cutting every letter in metal. Um, and we work with because because of digital communication, we can work with people in different countries. Um, and we work, our main designer work is, is German, but based in Poland, that we work with. Um, but as I said, sometimes I'll sketch, sometimes I'll draw fonts, still. Mm -hmm. But it's so time consuming now, because you have so many different formats to develop. It's more the technology is the thing that takes more time than anything. 
um, especially the designing variable fonts. Um, um, there's, there's so much technology, and I don't have time to learn. It's just crazy. Um, but then you're talking about, you said about, um, you know, some clients want really classical stuff. So, so this is Masha. I'm just going to show you this because this is from Masha Ma. Um, she's a, uh, uh, a great Chinese fashion designer. Um, and we did this typeface for her. And it's all based on different body parts. Um, and she then used it in um, her clothing. So it became part of her brand story and, and part of the product or the design space. So it's not always like super classical. We, there's a big bandwidth. And this is why I love fonts. They can, they can do so many different things. So you do, do you, um, at some point in your presentation, you say um, brands are not innovative anymore. Or is it just uh, at typeface or things because of social networks or something like that? If I do comparison again with like Picard and we have a lot of brands, typeface with brand, brands with uh, identity and things like that, I have the feeling that on the work you present or in your website, um, the identity is done with a typeface only, you know, there is nothing else. There is not so much image. I don't know exactly what you do when you do a rebranding, if you do some rebranding, but it's always uh, with graphic design, this type only or almost only with colors mm -hmm. or shape, mm -hmm. but there is no image, there is no logo, there is no f nothing only is the word or the description of the manipulation or, of, of letters, mm -hmm. make words, something like that. Oh, could you tell something about your philosophy of what is what is a brand, or why a brand doesn't need a logo or whatever? I, th I think it, I think it's the same everywhere. I think, as I said, brands tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A brand is no longer a logo. That's that. Those days are finished. Um, so brands don't even want logos. Logos get in the way, except. There's the profile picture on, on social media. And brands really want a strategy. So I end up writing more than designing. So brands want strategies. Um, because brands are tactical now. They're just interested in right. the next story, uh, the next wave of likes um, and followers. They're not interested in uh, the previous values of the brand, which is which is maybe a set of higher thoughts. Um, um, so what brands want is is what words do they say, and how do they say them, and that's it. Um, or what what is their approach to pictures, um, and who is the kind of audience they have. And that's it, does really. it because of the multiplication of channel of communication? Hmm? Because, does it because of the multiplication of channel of communication? So there is so many different ways to communicate with these people. Mm -hmm. You are not able to just put an ad on a financial time one day and on, on that seat. Mm -hmm. You have to explode. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I don't know. Brands, brands are obsessed with Instagram. I don't know, I mean, and then now brands are getting obsessed with TikTok and then, but it's so short-lived, you know, this isn't, this isn't a survival strategy for me. But if you're a type designer, you have a great, successful future ahead of you. Anyway. <laughs> are we ready for beers? <laughs> So sorry, so type Paris. Type Paris. Yeah, it's a good title. A good title? Yeah, it's Paris. the future. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when you will come back to Paris? I? When do you will you come back to Paris? When will you pay for me to come? <laughs> <laughs> Next year, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, I, I love, I still love, I love creative design. I 
to a level of that. Um, I'm not as in love with the strategy side, but um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.